Good afternoon. Welcome to the weekly livestock market update. A little bit earlier than we normally talk to you on a Friday afternoon. I'm Brownfield anchor reporter Megan Grebner with us as always to talk all things markets. University of Missouri, Scott Brown. Good afternoon, Scott. Good afternoon, Megan. A relatively quiet week this week when it comes to reports, um, but we're going to talk a little trade. We'll talk a little domestic demand, but to kick things off, let's recap what happened this week in the markets. Yeah, you know, if we talk about them as mid uh, midday on Friday, if we uh, look at uh, live cattle this week, down about uh, 40 cents uh, relative to where we were last week. So not a lot of change there. Those feeder cattle markets this week were anywhere from steady to $4 lower. Uh, on the futures side, and again, as of uh, 11 a.m. this morning, we saw the April live cattle futures contract down nearly 60 cents and that April feeder cattle contract down $2.30. Uh, on the beef side, choice box beef prices were down a little more than $5.50 this week. That was really due to what was some weaker rib and, and loin prices this week. That still leaves them nearly $28 above where they were a, a year ago at this time in terms of that box beef price. Uh, on the hog side, cash uh, barrel and gut prices stronger this week, up $2.80. Uh, the April lean hog futures contract uh, down 40 cents on the week. And the pork cutout value was basically unchanged on the week. It still sets $27 above year ago levels. That unchanged came as uh, some stronger bellies helped to offset what were uh, weaker ham prices this week. Before we get into some other uh, reports and some other conversations, I want to talk a little bit about what's been going on in the cash hog market. We're up to 80 so far this week. Uh, it has been consistently pushing higher and consistently, I mean, we're at some pretty big numbers when we look at that. What does that mean for producers? What are some things that we need to think about as we look at what's going on here? Yeah, so you ask a really good question. And, and I, I think I actually come back to, you know, you look at what we've been doing year to date um, in, in terms of hog slaughter, and we don't have this week data as, as you and I are talking today yet. Uh, we're, we're down nearly 4% year to date relative to, to a year ago. So I think we are seeing you know, some tighter supplies being helpful there um, as well. I think some stronger demand pull uh, continues to help us uh, on the hog side. And, and that's really despite what uh, we may talk about here in a little bit of, of exports that, that haven't taken off like they did a year ago at this time, but uh, uh, some good opportunities. And I hope folks will think about maybe some risk protection as there, there certainly is the opportunity for, for lower hog prices as we move through the year, but uh, it's good to see some positive signs. I, I mean, every day I see these numbers and I'm like, wow. At some point I keep thinking, one, it's got to take a break, but I'm also concerned if we had a supply chain disruption, if we had a demand disruption, uh, what's that going to do to prices? Because we talk about hog slaughter being and hog production just in time. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, and as we think about, you know, COVID-19 cases continue to move in the right direction for us, moving lower. But we don't know that we're completely out of the woods yet. Uh, these new variants continue to get discussion out there. And, and so I think it's just important to realize that there is a lot of risk left. And, and we just don't want to you know, say we're, we're over all this and, and life is good from a price standpoint uh, moving forward. So take advantage uh, if, if you need some risk protection as we look at some prices that are better than maybe we would have thought. Are we continuing to, to keep our eye on what's going on on the input side of things, watching corn, soybean prices, uh, and maybe needing to think about that in form in terms of risk management as well? So absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I come back to say um, getting some lower corn and soybean meal prices and locking those in might be a good strategy. There is just all kinds of risk on both sides of, of, uh, crop prices when I look at things. I think we're going to try to plant a lot of acres of corn and soybeans. Planting intentions, if it comes out with a pretty big number, could, could certainly uh, push uh, corn and, and soybean mill prices lower, and that might give us an opportunity. At the same time, we get out uh, June, July, start talking about dry weather. Well, that'll push prices much higher. We're just really tied on stocks, especially soybean stocks. So finding those opportunities where maybe we see some lower uh, lower prices for corn and soybeans, locking in some of those feed costs might be a good risk management strategy. Uh, may maybe it's not today yet, but uh, uh, certainly watching those markets is important. 
All right, uh, let's talk a little jobs. I also want to talk a little weather too, because you you brought up uh, drought conditions or or maybe uh, that issues later this summer. But we'll get there. Let's talk about jobs first. Um, jobs added in February. How is that playing out into that domestic demand picture, and are we continuing to move in the right direction? Yeah. So good news out of that jobs report. We added three hundred seventy nine thousand jobs in February. That was much stronger than uh, forecasts of what that employment number or uh, jobs added number was going to be. Um, I, I think as we again see COVID cases that are moving lower, it has given uh, the, the the opportunity for new jobs to be created. Uh, the the unemployment rate uh, out of that fell to six point two percent. So a, a lot of good news we're seeing out of that jobs report, and a, I think a lot of. Uh, this notion that domestic demand could really come on strong as we continue to hopefully recover uh, from COVID-19. Just keep buying, <laughs> just keep buying pork, right? And beef for that matter. <laughs> that, that, that's right. So lots of bacon and lots of steak and everything's going to be good. Let's celebrate and have a big cookout and grill and buy all the <laughs> U.S. beef and steaks and pork and bacon and everything you can imagine uh, uh, as these numbers keep moving in the right direction. That's right. That's right. <laughs> all right. Weekly trade data. Uh, pork exports have been lower in recent weeks, but um, really kind of some positive news this week a little bit. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so correct. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, year to date uh, weekly trade, of course, a lot of this is, is related to, to China. So down uh, 33,000 metric tons year to date. When you look at those weekly numbers, you look at all markets uh, year, year to date down about uh, 42,000. Um, the, the good news was some of the recent data uh, suggests some strength in some of these other markets, especially uh, the kind of the rest of the world is the way I would describe it, maybe a little less of our tr traditional market. So some, some, maybe some better news starting there. I think we'll have to continue to watch that China side as we go forward. I, I think we've talked about this a lot, that as that hog herd rebuilds, that their interest in U.S. pork may wane just a little bit. Uh, in the same breath, I think you can tell almost the opposite uh, story in, in the beef uh, side of the complex as weekly beef exports year to date to China up 12,000 metric tons. I think that's provided some uh, support to where um, box beef at least has, has gone of late. It certainly helped offset what's been a little bit weaker start to the year to uh, places like Japan, who's down almost 7,000 metric tons. You know, you look at the combination of all that and, and uh, we're just right on track, just down 4,000 or almost 5,000 metric tons. Uh, year to date to all markets on the beef side. So uh, let's hope we get some more strength again as those countries also uh, come out of some of the worst of COVID-19. We'll definitely have to see where that goes. I want to backtrack just a second. You, you mentioned watching drought conditions potentially this summer. We've had some issues in parts of the country. Uh, as we think about cattle producers, uh, how impactful and how much is that setting us up for concern as we get into 2021? Yeah, so if we continue with what the drought map looks like today for the next five months, that'll change the looks of the cattle industry uh, as, as we get out to June and July, because we're gonna need some grass growth in some of these areas. You know, you look back at, at the cattle report we got in January, and, and I'll say some of those beef cow numbers tell me that some of those driest Western states were probably moving cows to other parts of the country. And, and if, if, those cow, if those parts of the country uh, uh, don't recover from the worst of the drought, th those cows might go on down the road at some point. So we, we could see uh, some pretty interesting outcomes from this. And if that drought were to expand further to the east, uh, you know, you pick up a lot more cows as well in that mix. So it, it's we're, we're starting dry now to me it all comes down to do we get timely rains when we need them come uh, here the next few weeks to get these pastures greened up and give us enough growth to get through the year so it's it's not a done deal that we're we're going to be in a, a drought at uh, for 2021 but 
given where we sit right now, it seems like the probability is increasing as we go week to week. I think we literally here in Kentucky got very close to <laughs> to all of the rain. We may be short in about two days. We were flooding has been bad here, and and it's it's not been pretty. But well, spring is right around the corner, and I guess we should we should come to expect a, a little craziness from Mother Nature. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, I, and again, I look at a lot of parts of the country, and we're okay right now. Uh, Missouri, we've gotten some nice warm temperatures after what was that bitter cold and. Uh, if spring comes early and we get a lot of green up and, and pastures grow, uh, we, we might be in good shape. But uh, again, some of those Western states are in desperate need of, of water to get that uh, those pastures to, to green up and, and grow and provide forage this year. Scott, that'll do it for us this week as we look ahead to next Friday, a pretty big week for reports. What do we have? Yeah, we start the next week with monthly trade data. Um, give us the first shot of uh, monthly trade for, for January of this year. Uh, we get WASD, uh, monthly WASD report from USDA on Tuesday. And then we on the consumer side, we get retail prices and we end the week with consumer sentiment. Fantastic. We will talk to you next Friday. Have a great weekend. Hey, you do the same, Megan. We have our weekly live stock market update delivered to your email box every Saturday morning. Visit our website, brownfieldagnews.com. You can also submit questions and subscribe there. And for all of the great Brownfield podcasts while you're on the road or in the tractor, go to brownfieldagnews.com slash podcast. Have a great weekend. I'm Megan Grebner for Brownfield.